Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami wasn't just a celebration of the end of the pandemic and an opportunity to gather up close and maskless with more than 10,000 ideological fellow travelers. It was also a watershed moment for a technological and cultural movement whose goal is nothing short of the separation of money and state. Bitcoin emerged just a dozen years ago when a pseudonymous genius shared a nine-page paper on an obscure email list. And now it's the third largest currency on the planet. In another dozen years, we may look back on Bitcoin 2021 as the Woodstock of the crypto generation. The headline acts included former Congressman Ron Paul. I admit there's a lot of things about, you know, Bitcoins and other things that I don't fully understand, but I understand liberty. Twitter and Square CEO Jack Dorsey. We need to be able to transact with this every single day and everyone around the world needs to transact with it every day. Skateboard legend Tony Hawk, boxer Floyd Mayweather, sex tape entrepreneur Paris Hilton, DJ and record producer Diplo, and Ross Ulbricht, who beamed in from federal prison, where he is serving an effective life sentence for creating the pioneering dark website Silk Road, which helped bootstrap Bitcoin in its early years. The conference ended with an announcement that El Salvador will become the first country on earth to recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. I will send to Congress a bill that will make Bitcoin a legal tender in El Salvador. One of the breakout stars of the conference was Cynthia Lummis, a 66-year-old freshman Republican senator from Wyoming. From the stage and in an interview with Reason, Lummis forcefully made the case that Bitcoin not only provides a fully legitimate alternative store of value and medium of exchange, but would act as a check on the devaluation of the U.S. dollar and other currencies through the runaway creation of fiat money. She also believes that the growth of Bitcoin, a sale for its heavy use of electricity, is acting as a spur to create renewable energy in Wyoming and around the globe. And she extolled its privacy features in a world of increasing surveillance by governments and corporations alike. Senator, thanks for talking to Reason. It's my pleasure, Nick. What's your main interest in crypto? I mean, you're in the Senate and in Congress more broadly. You're like a leading light on this type of stuff. What do you what do you see as the value of this new technology, especially as it intersects with a uh, you know a kind of fiat currency system that has really gone off the rails? Uh, I had been my state's treasurer in Wyoming, so I, I was, think that suffices. I understand why you're interested in crypto. Yeah, I was always looking for a store of value, mm -hmm. and I see Bitcoin specifically as a great store of value. Uh, only 21 million will ever be uh, developed, and so we know that scarcity uh, will protect its value going into the future, unlike the U.S. dollar that we're printing more of every single day. Oh, yeah. I mean, by the end of this interview, there will be millions more in circulation, right? But, uh, I mean, I would think you're in the U.S. Senate. Is is Bitcoin or is crypto more broadly, is that a competitor to, you know, the U.S. dollar? It's not a competitor, but it is an alternative saving instrument for people who, like me who are concerned that the U.S. dollar saved will be worth far less uh, than when it's deposited in savings. So to me, I see it as an opportunity to save for my future in something that will grow in value, not fall in value. Do you own Bitcoin or I other do. crypto? Yeah, I do. Okay, have you? Are you cashing out, or are you? Oh uh, no, are I'm you, a, you're long on Bitcoin. I'm I'm what they call a hodler. Okay. I'm long. <laughs> I'm in it for the distance. You are a hodler. Um, what is you? You are working um, both to bring kind of a, an understanding and a legislative agenda around crypto, you know, into fruition. What's the regulatory framework that you want to see crypto, um, you know, being used that apart from Currently, it basically is treated as a private uh, um, a commodity, a commodity. Mm -hmm. so it's subject to things like capital gains tax. Where, where do you see things going? What, what's your dream vision? It is to create a regulatory and statutory framework, a sandbox, if you will, that uh, innovators know the parameters, but the parameters don't constrain them in, in their innovation as they develop uh, new uses, new tools, new opportunities. Uh, so uh, the blockchain will provide, for example, the opportunity uh, to put both contracts and the money or value associated with that contract on the blockchain uh, so it cannot be adulterated or have there be miscommunication about 
uh, what the contract entails. So it, it makes a, a, a secure uh, framework, uh, and we want to make sure that legislation protects that and doesn't uh, s stifle innovation. So you want to have a kind of clear, predictable, stable set of rules in place, and then that way people can kind of get on with the business of building a crypto world. That's correct, Nick. What's the timeline for that, and where are the main sticking points? Is it mostly that people have no idea what you're talking about, or is it that they're like, I kind of get this and I don't like this because it might hem in my ability to keep printing money? Right now, uh, the lack of understanding or knowledge about what uh, the distributed ledger is, what Bitcoin is, what blockchain is, it's a total mystery to most members of Congress. Uh, so the first part's going to be to inform, educate, bring in experts who can help explain the importance of this. Some of the urgency is because China is making a digital yuan and intends to roll it out, as we understand, at the Winter Olympics in 2022. Uh, they want to uh, compete against uh, the U.S. status as having the dollar as the world reserve currency. So that's some of the urgency. Are you in favor of the U.S. creating digital dollars as well? I am. Okay, and you're not worried that that, uh, to the extent that the U.S. gets into the digital space, it's just going to pollute the pool? It's not. Um, there are different reasons to have a digital dollar or a central bank digital currency uh, than uh, to have Bitcoin. Uh, as long as the dollar uh, is in use, uh, it's important that we uh, make faster transactions, that they clear faster, that people have more opportunity uh, to use a digital format for the U.S. dollar. Uh, then. Uh, to use Bitcoin, it would be for perhaps a different purpose, at mm -hmm. least initially. Right. So that's where you're going to go to buy your soon-to-be legal drugs, right? You're going to go on the dark net web and use Bitcoin. <laughs> Did you ever use Silk Road, Senator, may I ask? <laughs> you know, I, um, am, uh, I'm aware that there are uh, uh, softwares that can detect uh, fraud or illicit use. Uh, of uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain. And it usually has to do with a pattern of use uh, that would require the um, usual privacy associated with Bitcoin uh, to be transgressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the, the software is working well uh, that uh, uh, can ferret out illicit uses. So you're not worried about, I mean, this is one of the growing case against uh, Bitcoin and crypto in general, that as it gets more popular, it's only being used by criminals or for bad actions. You don't really buy that. Not at all. In fact, it is used less for criminal activity uh, than traditional fiat currency is. How do you feel about uh, China is, you know, on the one hand, a plurality of Bitcoin mining is being done in China, at least as best as we can tell. So people are like, oh, well, we have to attack Bitcoin because we have to attack China from a United States point of view. But the Chinese government is also cracking down on crypto. You know, what worries you the most about how the Chinese government is acting towards Bitcoin? They're cracking down on Bitcoin because they want to give rise to the digital yuan. Uh, the digital yuan will allow them to surveil its use. So they'll be able to track the way people are using uh, digital yuan. And they'll be able to punish people who are using it in ways that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like. If they contribute to a religious organization, they'll be able to crack down on them. Maybe a person contributes to a re religious organization and then tries to rent a car to drive to another city in China. They're not going to be able to. These are the kind of manipulative tactics that will be used with a digital yuan. So having a digitized dollar that is much more private because of our own constitutional bill of rights, the Fourth Amendment, will provide a degree of privacy that the yuan is intended not to have. And then there's Bitcoin, which is even more private, not anonymous, as a lot of people say, it's more pseudonymous, but it, it provides privacy. It seems like a lot of Republicans over the past 20 years or so have gotten away from that idea um, you know, that things should be private because the government doesn't have any business knowing what you're up to. And it doesn't mean like if you want privacy that you're a criminal. 
But it seems like in the in the Bitcoin argument, a lot of people increasingly on the Republican side of the aisle are like, if we can't find out, if the government can't find out what's going on, we should regulate it tightly. You you seem to be coming from a different tradition. Absolutely. I want to disabuse people of that and have them recognize that Bitcoin, um, because of its privacy, uh, is is very freedom loving and oriented. Take, for example, the fact that today people in Venezuela uh, can privately convert their wealth to Bitcoin uh, so they can avoid the hyperinflation and the repressive regime uh, that uh, didn't used to exist. It, it provides great freedom to people who are living in hyperinflation or repressive governments. So um, it works in the United States. <laughs> Well, and as we see inflation growing, uh, it should, I think, alert uh, the Fed uh, that their proposed 2% inflation strategy is not working right now and that we need to address this. There's too much money floating around in uh, the economy right now. You mentioned that you were interested in crypto because you had served as Wyoming's treasurer. What, what about intellectually? How did you get into uh, the idea of uh, competing private currencies. Did you read a lot of Milton Friedman or Friedrich Hayek, or where did that come from? Actually, my reading of Hayek uh, came after uh, my first investment in Bitcoin, uh, which was in 2013. Uh, and once you invest in something, you have a little skin in the game, yeah. you start to learn more about it. Uh, so I invested as uh, an experiment and that experiment has become uh, an, not only an interest, but now a fascination. Um, one of the other arguments in the United States that's being advanced increasingly against Bitcoin is that it's an energy hog. Through a couple of poorly structured studies, the idea is that if Bitcoin actually becomes a global currency, all the electricity on the planet, maybe in the universe, will be devoted to Bitcoin transactions. That's not true. But you have talked about how Bitcoin is actually helping to either um, make use of stranded energy or curtailed energy in Wyoming or actually develop renewable uh, supply. Can you talk about that? Well, we know that even now, um, Bitcoin mining is 40% sourced by renewables, whereas globally the average use is 12%. So even now, uh, it is more intensively used using non-hydrocarbon sources of energy. But in Wyoming, you'll see a trailer full of uh, Bitcoin mining equipment pull into uh, an oil and gas drill site. Uh, they'll hook up to the natural gas that's being vented into the atmosphere because it's not yet hooked up to a pipeline, and they'll use that as a source of energy. So it's actually taking uh, an asset that's stranded and being wasted uh, and using it to mine Bitcoin. Why isn't that more widely appreciated? Uh, I think that people like me uh, need to use the opportunity that you've given me today, Nick, to explain that. Which party uh, is better on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general, do you think? Crypto, Bitcoin, blockchain, when you say these things, you know, some people like their eyes light up, many other people, you know, they get dark scowls on their face. You know, is the Republican Party better on Bitcoin than the Democratic Party? Is it old people versus young people, coasts versus rural? What is it? That's what's so fun about it, is it, it's, it's all of those things and none of those things. Uh, we have a financial innovation caucus that, was, that I founded uh, with uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, a Democrat, and it is bipartisan. Uh, we have members of both parties, and uh, in the House there is interest in cryptocurrency and financial technology and Bitcoin from both parties, and it's all age groups. Uh, most of the people I'm meeting with here are younger, a lot younger than I am. They're my daughter's age. Uh, and so they're informing me and educating me uh, as I try to figure out how we can craft uh, a regulatory framework that doesn't stifle uh, what all these young innovators are trying to do. It takes me a while to grasp some of their um, thought processes because they're so far ahead of me in terms of understanding technology. But um, I'm, I'm catching up and I need to help my colleagues in Congress catch up. Some of the people we're talking to here are you know, very worried that the government, the federal government, is going to come after Bitcoin at some point and that they're going to you know, either 
take it over or destroy it. What can you tell them about whether that's going to happen? The people that I talk to that are policymakers, that are thinking the way I'm thinking, want to make sure that doesn't happen. We want to make sure that Bitcoin, stable coins, tokens can innovate, and the U.S. dollar can innovate as well and become uh, a digital currency. So there's going to be formats uh, that people can use that are much more user-friendly uh, than uh, our more old-fashioned forms of currency. Young people are ready to embrace it. People my age are either nervous about it or perhaps they're in traditional banking and they think that this is going to pull the rug out from under their business. So we have to find ways to explain it uh, so traditional bankers understand that, yes, it's going to change their business model, but it's not going to destroy their business model. Uh, and we need to inform policymakers uh, that of the benefits of having these various uh, opportunities to store wealth and value uh, can exist side by side. You mentioned your age. How old are you? I'm 66. Okay, so you're on the young side of the Senate, actually, <laughs> right? This is, I mean, this is true. Do you worry at all that America is becoming a gerontocracy? I'm, I'm close enough in age to you where I remember looking at Soviet leaders and being like, oh my God, they're ancient. And, you know, they're not. They were in their 50s when the Soviet Union collapsed. Do you worry that American leadership is getting old and that with that kind of old age comes fear and anxiety about the future? Young people are as worried as people my age that we're spending too much money. Uh, that the U.S. dollar will lose value, that will have inflation, maybe hyperinflation. Uh, so they want to see uh, an alternative like Bitcoin protected. We want to see tokens and stable coins available. So there are places to go if the U.S. dollar uh, underperforms dramatically. That's true of people of both ages. What I am finding, however, is that too many members of Congress uh, continue to believe that we can spend more and more. We cannot do that, and we're going to have to adjust. And among the ways we can adjust is to help provide opportunities for Bitcoin. Republicans tend to talk a really good game about cutting the size, scope, and spending of government when they're not in power. Um, you know, under Donald Trump, spending went up when Republicans were in power. Uh, you know, uh, over the past year, spending has gone through the roof. It continues to go through the roof. Is there any remnant left, a serious remnant in the Republican Party that's talking about reducing the size, scope, and spending of government? Um, there, it is so small, and it, it is so uh, overwhelmed by people who uh, see no end to spending and, and don't want to be part of an end to spending. So I think the Republican Party has pretty much abandoned uh, its concern about the debt and the deficit and spending. Uh, so I, and, and the whole reason I ran for Congress uh, and now ran for the Senate is because I'm concerned about the debt, the deficit and spending. Uh, but I'm in such a small minority of members uh, who uh, are concerned about it that w we're going to lose. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that Bitcoin uh, is, is attractive to me, and I want to make sure we protect and nurture uh, its capabilities because uh, at some point, if we had a black swan event, uh, at least we'd have an alternative, and Bitcoin represents that store of value that I'm concerned we might lose with the U.S. dollar. Uh, are there any Democrats who are also worried about the spending? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I serve with some on something called the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. That was a very bipartisan group. It still exists. Uh, I had to leave that board when I ran for the U.S. Senate, but I continue to uh, use them for advice, counsel, and policy ideas. Uh, but we know we're swimming upstream, and uh, we, I, I very much want to run parallel courses. One is to try to save the U.S. dollar. The other is to uh, enhance the opportunity for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency in case we jump the track and crash the train. Senator, thanks so much for talking to Reza. My pleasure, Nick. Thank you.